guys. So this is a, we have a, a tremendous panel. I know there's a little bit of their bios are in the in your programs, but I want to introduce everybody firsthand in real life. Um, Lisa Cortez, there are films that Lisa has produced that you know because they've been on the big screen and reviewed in the New York Times, Shadow Boxer, of course the Academy Award winning Precious, but she also makes small, small and intimate films about West African fables and the struggles of growing older. Lisa has her own film company now and it's just returned from Rotterdam and we'll hear about her new work. She's working with um, cinematographer Ernest Dickinson. Please welcome Lisa Cortez. When I think of Wynne Thomas's work, I think of the word range. As a, a prolific production designer, he has designed movies from a beautiful mind to analyze this, analyze that, <laughs> get smart, <laughs> wag the dog, he got game. Um, and we should offer our congratulations because he just won Best Production Design and ex in Excellence in Production Design Awards for his work for creating the world of the movie Hidden Figures. Please welcome him. <laughs> About three days ago, that was just... That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Sam Pollard. Sam is one of those hyphenate people, editor, hyphen, producer, hyphen, professor. Uh, of course, he's known for his work on the Academy Award nominated documentary, Four Little Girls, about the 1963 Birmingham bombings. He's worked extensively with Spike Lee, editing Mo' Better Blues, Jungle Fever, Girl Six. Had a great movie called Two Trains Running about... Um, civil rights workers in the 60s and the search for some, um, some blues men. It was really interesting. Uh, please welcome Sam Pollard. So Sam, you got into this business accidentally. You were a business student over at Baruch, and then you heard about this place called WNET and had some little program going on. Tell people about how you ended up discovering that film was going to be your future? It was uh, 1971. I got invited to, uh, to interview at the program. That really, she had the film television workshop they had started in 1968 after Dr. King's assassination to get more people of color behind the camera, in the editing room, doing producing, doing sound. So I interviewed for the program. I got accepted. It was a one-year program where it was about 25 of us, really. And we had professionals come in two times a week. We did most of our work at Chuck Stewart, who's a wonderful photographer of jazz musicians. We did most of the work at his studio, but we would have professionals, professional directors, professional cinematographers, professional editors come in twice a week and teach us the business. And then we'd go out and shoot little short films, and they'd critique them, we'd learn to edit. And I gravitated, of all the things that we were doing in the, uh, in the classes, I gravitated to the editing because I was very shy back then. I didn't like to talk, and I felt very comfortable in that dark room, putting the material, the images, the shots together, the 16 millimeter. So it was, a, you know, it was like a real happenstance. I was, I thought I was going to be a rich businessman, <laughs> but it didn't happen. And after that program, I was very fortunate to get a job as an assistant editor on a classic feature film called Gondrian Hess. Wow. That was directed by the late Bill Gunn. And uh, my career started from there. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did filmmaking offer you that you weren't getting from your, cho your original chosen career? You know, I always say the thing that happened to me, the first little film we shot at the, uh, in the workshop at NET was Lincoln Center. We had to shoot Lincoln Center. It was supposed to be MOS, just images. <clears throat> and I was the assistant camera person. I was the editor. And I remember being in the editing room that first night, working on an upright movieola, putting the shots together. And after I put, after I put this little two-minute sequence together, I looked at the order of the shots, and I didn't like the order. And I decided to move the shots around, and I did. And as soon as I did that, there was like this light bulb went off in my head, and I said, wow, being creative. And I had never thought about that before. And that was sort of like... It was like something that was like so refreshing, such a revelation that this idea of being creative was something I just grabbed onto, you know. And yeah. it was like I had always loved watching movies, but now I wanted to really make movies. You know. When you grew up in Philadelphia, you went to college, Boston University, yes. and you got a degree in theater <coughs> design. Mm -hmm. How did you know that's what you wanted to do? Uh, I was very lucky in the sense that uh, the, the sort of I got thunderstruck very early on. Um, I 
uh, as a teenager, saw um, Tennessee Williams' Summer in Smoke on television. And for some reason, that movie really spoke to me. And as a result of that, I, I um, kind of went to the library and I read everything I could about that Tennessee Williams had written. And uh, um, shortly thereafter, uh, I, uh, there was a theater company in Philadelphia called Society Hill Playhouse, which was an amateur theater country, company. Uh, I was too young to audition for it, but I encouraged my uh, uh, older sister to go audition for the company because she had been in plays in high school and thought she wanted to be an actress. So um, she went and auditioned, and I trailed along with her, and she ended up being cast uh, uh, and sh uh, at the theater. And I ended up uh, just uh, hanging, you know, travel. I ended up going to the theater with her and starting off there as an usher, uh, and then ended up, she ended up doing one season's worth of plays, and I ended up staying for the next three years. So I spent my teenage years working at this theater company. This company was doing all kinds of really interesting work, um, plays by Genet and by Gunter Grass and Bertolt Breck. So it was a really uh, wonderful way to sort of jumpstart a career. And that's how I, I uh, got started. And, and, and in high school, I uh, was an art major. So I wanted to combine my love of theater with my love of art, and I decided to become a set designer as a result. What was it like when you made the transition from theater, because you worked here at the New York Public Theater and others, to film? What did you have to adjust? Well, I, I think designing is designing is designing. The hurdles that were put in the way were put in the way by other people who felt that I was not able to make that transition. Um, there, it is, uh, for me, it is a different vocabulary. So part of what you do is that, you know, much of movie making is on-the-job training. And then once you, you become familiar with that vocabulary, I think the design process for me is still pretty much the same. So Lisa, you, you go to Yale University, you graduate, and you say to your parents and your friends, I'm going to help start a hip hop label. <laughs> 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 Which I'm sure they went, wait, what? Is this <laughs> Tell me about that decision. Wow. And to let people know about your background, it's, it wasn't originally in film. It was in the music industry. Uh, yes, so uh, working in film is my second incarnation, and there might be a third. <laughs> I think that's something that all of us as artists uh, have to embrace, is that ability to adapt um, and to listen to our hearts. Um, but when I graduated with my degree in literature, and, and um, I was in a band for two years, so my parents were already a, a little frightened. <laughs> and then I was uh, very excitedly told them that I had talked my way into a job at a small company called Def Jam. Wow. Um, and uh, I was very lucky to be a part of that, uh, the foundation of both the management company, Rush, and the record label. Uh, and so much that I learned at that space uh, has influenced me uh, in my personal life, but also professionally, in terms of the, our ability to change culture, to uh, draw outside the lines, and um, like to always put on some Tribe Called Crest when <laughs> days are, are, are complicated. I so relate to you in so many ways because we're about the same vintage and I went to Brown and I told my parents I got a job as an assistant at, at this little place called MTV. And they were like, what? Uh -huh. <laughs> in 1988. And they were like, what, what are you doing with your English literature degree? <laughs> it was a different New York. It was very you know, different. Yeah. You could find an apartment for $200 uh, a month. <laughs> uh, uh, you wow. might be living far out. Uh, and, and it didn't matter that you didn't have health insurance. You know, I didn't have health insurance for, for a bit, but um, I thought I was indestructible, and I was always uh, buoyed by the company that I was in. And uh, we had no, there was no definition, uh, there was no hierarchy. It was, it was like, oh, you want to do that? Get it done. So I was able to uh, create positions and um, travel all over the world and um, advocate for the culture and uh, the artists that I worked with. You touched on this a little bit, but how did your work at Def Cham and working in that community inform your work as a movie producer? 
Well, um, it's really interesting to be back here at 825 8th Avenue because after I left Def Jam, um, I, I came to a company called Polygram, which was mm -hmm. uh, housed in this building. I was a VP of A&R and I signed a lot of different uh, music artists and uh, produced uh, cast albums for Jelly's Last Jam. Um, and the, uh, the connection was that uh, the, that, that time taught me just to, like, to go for it, to uh, uh, use net, uh, relationships to further kind of what we needed to make happen. I want to talk to you all a little bit about the process of filmmaking and getting films made, and then we'll talk a little bit more about diversity and inclusion. Sam, I was watching you uh, in a class, and you were talking to your students, and you used the word texture. And I know that's an important word to you, Win, as well. And one of the kids looked at me and said, what's texture? <laughs> and you kind of had to explain it. Can you, can you share a little bit what you feel texture is and why it needs to be in film no, and what it does? I, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer that... Uh, film is art and that a good filmmaker who makes a film is bringing to hopefully going to bring to the screen a story be it in a narrative film or a documentary an experimental film going to bring a story that's going to exhibit what i call nuance and texture and mood which is an important to me element in telling the story you know and and that's part of that texture you know and and when i'm teaching a class i'm always telling i'm always hoping the students will want to understand that as artist because I'm saying you know even though I know it's a craft to me it's art and the challenge is to always try to figure out how to elevate your craft to art to make it special and you got to have a to me you have to have a sort of a unique perspective and vision about how to do that it's a challenge to do it you know as we all know it's a challenge to do it but you have to push yourself so that's why texture is an important word in my vocabulary mm -hmm. when I'm talking to film students. And when, why is texture an important word Well, for I think, uh, I agree with everything that Sam said, but I also think um, um, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, I want the audience to feel something. Yeah. Uh, and I, when I read a script, one of the first questions I ask myself is how do I feel about the material? And then the, another question is, how do I want the audience to feel? So as a production designer, I have three <coughs> tools to help communicate how I feel to the audience. I have color, line, and texture. And I think we, it's very, we all understand how color can contribute to how we feel about something. Uh, line, of course, has to do with the shape of something. Is it a tall room? Is it a rectangular room? Is it a narrow room? And texture is also very much a big important part of, of that process because something smooth feels something very different than, some, than something rough. that's rough or stone. Right. So um, we as communicators, as an artist and a storyteller, have these three things to use, uh, particularly when you're a production designer, to help communicate to the audience what it is that we're trying to get them to feel. Because it really is about feeling. When I, well, I don't want the audience to come to look at my movies and go, "Oh, doesn't that look great?" I do hope that they are go that they are going on a journey in which they are feeling something as they're going on that journey. That's what I think good production design is. Lisa, in getting Precious made, it was a fairly long process, about five years, five or six mm -hmm. years. Um, Tell us a little bit about that mo one moment when you thought, yes, this is happening, this is so good, and that one moment you thought, this is not happening, this is so hard. Um, finding Gabourey City Bay is, is that moment mm -hmm. that makes that film uh, so good and so important. Um, we went to Hollywood and they were like, well, what about Raven Simone? <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic, right? But she's she was not that um, young woman who we needed to inhabit uh, that character. Um, I think you know the the difficult moments were the ones where where it was just you know two people in the office pushing things that get ahead and um, 
figuring out, you know, where were we going to find support for, for the film before it premiered at Sundance. Obviously, everything changed at that time. Um, I think like <coughs> scooping up dog poop in the Bronx hmm. in, you know, 25 degree weather was also a, a low <laughs> moment. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that part of filmmaking we don't hear about. Um, you know, Precious is, deals with difficult themes, um, teen pregnancy, literacy, rape, abuse. Tell me a little bit about the challenges of getting funding for it, or even getting people to hear, we want to make this story with a cast of people of color that's not immediately a happy movie, even though it does have, a, it, has, it has these wonderful periods of hope in it, especially at the end. Well, as a producer, what is my main driver is passion. You know, uh, I, hearing these gentlemen talk about texture, I thought like my key word is passion because that is the only thing that will keep me going when I feel alone and that nobody wants to hear uh, these stories. Um, I think one of the, the great pluses in favor of uh, and, and supporting the realization of the film was the novel push by Sapphire, mm -hmm. which um, is such a landmark work and uh, revered by many people. So that certainly opened up some doors. And um, I think that, you know, once I, I love working on projects that are based on books because you know that in your conversations with people, you can look at not only the film itself, but the underlying source material and an audience that has already been created that you feel will be interested in the project. Sam, I watched Four Little Girls last night again. Wow. And it's just, it's such a good movie. It's such, I had to walk away at one point and come back and, and watch it again. And I wondered for you as an editor, this is just a personal question, when you're living with that material day in and day out, the interviews with the mothers describing their daughters and their daughters playing and then that day when they went to church, um, what is that like for you to, to sit with that kind of material day in and day out? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, for me that was made Four Little Girls so personal is that uh, as when Spike did all the interviews with the mothers and the siblings of the girls, listening to their voices, listening to these people who were from the South, from Alabama, for me, working on the material day in and day out was like listening to family. So my family is from the South, my father's from Mississippi, my mother's from Georgia, I got uncles and cousins, you know, that's all from all across the country, but grew up in the South. So just the rhythm of their voices, it was, it was in a way it was comforting. As sad as some of those stories were, it was comforting because I was hearing family, you know. So when I'm sitting in the editing room and I'm, and I'm very fortunate enough to work on material like that, that can touch me like that, it doesn't, it, it, it makes me feel good to be working on it, to be a part of being responsible to hopefully make that story come to life. Mm -hmm. I had the same reaction, quite honestly, when me and Spike did when the levees broke. Yeah. You know, again, we were in the South, in New Orleans, the, dealing with people who were going through the whole tragic experience of Hurricane Katrina. And again, it was like, as tough as that material was, it was like I was hearing family, you know? and. Sometimes for me, the projects that attract me are those projects that speak to sort of my own sort of personal experiences, my personal life experiences. You know. When one of the challenges that you have in creating worlds is you have to feed the artistic God and the practical God. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about balancing those, those two masters. Uh, for me, uh, the story, the script is, uh, the, found, the foundation from which I'm working from. Really all of the answers are in the script. Um, and I uh, will always start with, so I, I look to the script for guidance. And I look, f so I look to it for, um, uh, again, to um, try to determine how I feel about it and what I want the audience to feel. So there's several, there's a bunch of questions. I read for story first. Story is the most important for me because that's what I have to serve. 
Uh, and then there's usually a series of conversations that I have with the director. And the important thing is to find out what are the important issues for the director and how I can serve those issues. Um, the practical parts of combining, at some point or the, another, the practical aspects of getting the movie made come into the picture. But generally what happens for me is that I try and serve the artistic needs first. Uh, I try, uh, as a designer, uh, one of the things that I try and do is, is formulate a concept or an approach that I'm going to take towards designing the film. And then I present that approach to the director and usually write that concept up. And then I present that concept to the whole company because the whole idea is for the whole company, for the whole, the whole filmmaking community to work within the parameters of that concept. Um, so the artistic stuff is always very, very important to me. The practical stuff will end up working its way in and you'll will solve that stuff as it presents itself to you. As we're talking about diversity and inclusion in the arts, there's some discussion about which is the best word to use, diversity or inclusion, or is it some combination of both? Lisa, which, which speaks to you? Is it one or the other, or is it the combo? Um, well, I think that diversity is when you get invited to the prom, and inclusion is when you get asked to dance, mm -hmm. and then you became, become the class president. Mm -hmm. So inclusion is what the word I prefer to use. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it, Sam? Inclusion and diversity as well. I don't know. I got to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about it. I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting. It's, those are two interesting <coughs> words. I mean, coming into business after, after I got out of the NA, after I, left the NET workshop, the first few films I worked on, they were all white. You know, the editors were white, the producers were white. After Ganji and Hess, they were all white films. And I didn't see many people of color, and I kept thinking, well, where are they? Where are they? You know, there weren't many editors. There was maybe you Robertson, there was Madeline Anderson who was at NET. You know, there was uh, John Carter. You know, there weren't many black editors, so I was saying, where are they? So I, I think I'm going to go with Lisa with inclusion. Mm -hmm. I think inclusion is an important word because, <coughs> you know, the fact that we've seen over the years what I call is we take two steps forward and then go two steps back. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that, it's the question, always the question is who's running the industry, both the movie industry mm -hmm. and the TV industry, you know. And that's always been a challenge to me in terms of having more inclusion in this business. And when, what do you think? I like the word inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, diversity has the word divide as part of that. And mm -hmm. I think uh, um, inclusion really means bringing people together. Yeah. And I think that's what's necessary in order to, to, to address this problem. Um, I think um, it's easier when you're talking to uh, other people to talk about inclusion. I think for some reason when you're talking about diver diversity, it becomes a divisive mm -hmm. conversation, ironically. And when you're, when you're talking about bringing all kinds of people, it's a much gentler conversation. And unfortunately, I think that there are times when the conversation needs not to be gentle. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're trying to bring people on board and trying to get them to change their mind, uh, I think when you use the word inclusion, it, it becomes a, a, from a practical point of view, it just becomes an easier con conversation. This is a question for all of you. If It's a two-part question. Is there one concrete practical thing you think could be done, a small thing, that would change the direction of things? And what's one pie in the sky Amazing, you've got a magic wand, you can change things. I, 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 look, I, here's what I'd say to people all the time. The, simple, the simplest thing to solve this problem is to hire. Exactly. It's not abstract. It's not something that you can't do. It's you something hire. that we all can do as an individual. If you want to change this problem, the simplest thing to do is to hire. If movie executives want to change this situation, 
then they, all their assistants who go on to become producers. producers and heads of studios, all those people should be people of color. You want to then, then the next generation of producers and executives will be those people. In my own department, I just finished Hidden Figures. My department was the only department that had a wide range of people in it. Why? Because I hire. Now, all the folks who were working on that people, Hidden Figures were lovely, wonderful, liberal people. But if you don't take the simple act of going out and hiring someone, then none of it will change. You can do all the training programs in the world, which all of them are very, very good. But the simplest thing you can do, that we can do as individuals, is to hire. Because people need the practical experience. You know, I, I completely agree with you. And I, what I do is, I love now, I, I have intergenerational crews. And, and so that, you know, I, I need to learn from someone who's 22, and they need to learn from me. Um, but I make certain that I have a database of a variety of people that I can go to and give them opportunity. Um, I just uh, produced Gabrielle Sidibe's directorial debut. It's called The Tale of Four. And when I look at the picture of our team, I am so happy because everybody is in the mix in all departments, not just in front of the camera, but also below the line. Because the change is, the, it's about getting to the, the structural integrity and kind of pulling it apart mm -hmm. and reordering who has a seat at the table. What did I say? I just agree with, with, with what Wen's saying. I think it, we have a responsibility in terms of when we hire people. You know, you're reaching out to make sure the inclusion is wide. You know, I, I have, you know, mentored lots of young editors now. Latinas, African Americans, Asians, you know, because <laughs> I just think that's important. You know, it's like, you know, it used to be a time when you go on the set, as Wen knows, was the crew be white, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, and you would hire and say, well, I need to hire a sound person. And you would never hear about a person of color. But now, I, you know, as I've been in this industry so long, I know people. So I make sure I try to make sure there's more inclusion every time I hire, every time I go on a shoot, every time I produce a shoot, every time I'm directing, every time I'm looking for a new assistant editor, you know, I'm trying to make sure that I open up my, my own eyes, yeah. you know. Something. Can I tell another yeah, story? Please. Look, I'm, again, I just want to use Hidden Figures as an example just to talk about this issue. And the reason it's important that we be in the room, that we be in the table. We're doing a movie about math. So someone has to come on and teach the women about math. It's its own particular language. It's very, very specific. And it's very difficult to learn. But someone, so we, you know, I did A Beautiful Mind. We had the math consultant on that movie. So here I am doing Hidden Figures again. So we need to. So, we're having a discussion with the producing staff, and said, well, you know, we should go, well, we'll go over to Georgia Tech and we'll get a math person from there. <laughs> okay. I'm in the room here, all right? <laughs> so I kind of hear this conversation. I'm hearing this conversation. So I'm out scouting. I go over to Morehouse, and I go over to Spelman, and I go to their math department, and I say, we need a math consultant. Can you guys give me some names of some people? Yeah. And so what I did is I got those names. I narrowed those, that list down. I took that list to the producers. And I said, no, we're going to get somebody from Morehouse and Spelman. Now, the thought of going to Georgia Tech is a perfectly wonderful thought. But w the reason we need to be in the room is to encourage them to think outside that box, that box because they're not going to do it. When you were talking about the, the big wish, mm -hmm. it, 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 I, I would, my big wish is that people step out of their bubbles. That's you know, right. most people, right. uh, they wake up in Hancock Park and they drive to Santa Monica to mm -hmm. their office and, you know, they get pitches and this and that and they talk to the people that they know and they went to school with. I, I the, the, you know, what we do is that, you know, we're out in the world. I mean, that's wh what informs our practice. We cannot create, um, or I cannot create in a bubble. 
and and so I would love to see that bubble pierced and you know, what's that show on TV where you know undercover boss uh, you know <laughs> like come on go yeah. and 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 spend some time in Detroit get embedded get connected because I think that is that increases not only our empathy but um, a knowledge of the range of talent and also interesting stories that are out there. And so what you're saying is it goes to the people who are thinking, I want to be an ally, I just don't know how, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. so it was an interesting story, I don't know if you remember, at TCA, Television Critics Association, on 2014-15, the president of FX gave this big speech about how progressive they were and all this interesting programming, and they had it, and someone pointed out that they had the fewest number of women of color and directors, it was 12%. Mm -hmm. And the president of FX was horrified, he had no idea and, and two th by 2015 and 16, they had 50% women of color mm. and uh, directors of women of color and people of color because John Landgraf made it a priority. He just decided, yeah, this sure. is what you need to do, and it started at the top. Yeah. I, you know, I, here's the thing. This conversation about diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. usually happens when we're in the room. The problem that I have is that I don't think it's happening in rooms in which there's strictly just white people. Mm -hmm. White people are not talking about inclusion and diversity amongst themselves. They're not having that conversation. I, ha you know, I go and I have this conversation with my agents, blah, 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 but I know damn well when my agents are by amongst themselves and when they're talking to other people, mm -hmm. they're not having this conversation. Okay. And this is where I, I agree with you, Lisa, and I think, in other words, it's. It's not enough to uh, just talk about it when you're with uh, black or brown people. You have to want that. You have to really be passionate about this or, or be interested in this when you're talking to your peers. Because um, I think that is where, for me, that is where the big problem is. Because if they were talking about it all the time or if it was really something that was of concern to them, I do think that we would see bigger changes. And I, I just don't think, I think the conversation is happening when I'm in the room. It's not happening when I'm not in the room. Mm -hmm. Sam, can you think of a time in your career when you knew that your race was an obstacle and how you either ran over it, worked around it, decided it was just not going to get in your way? In the early part of my career, I felt it wasn't going to, I wasn't even going to deal with it. I, I think from the age of 24 to about 28, I had this attitude that I wanted to be a part of the American melting pot. I didn't want to work on any black films. Uh -huh. I didn't want to deal with any films that dealt with, you know, I didn't want to get, what I, what I said back then, pigeonholed. Yeah. But then I was very fortunate. In 1980, I just did a low budget feature film in Los Angeles with a director named George Bowers. And he introduced me to uh, St. Clair Bourne. Oh, wow. And St. Clair Bourne is a well-respected African-American documentary filmmaker. And I was doing a film with him, editing a film with him about Chicago blues. And we would spend, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day, nine hours a day in the edit room, and we'd go out and talk. And here was this guy who was like maybe four or five years older than me. And, talking about the responsibility as an African-American male to make films that empower our community and look at our stories. And I said, yeah. God damn it, Saint is right. <laughs> <laughs> and from that point on, I said, I'm, you know, I'm doing films about our people. I'm going to be involved in films about our people and our stories because our stories are American history. Mm -hmm. So that's been my responsibility and part of my mandate ever since. Right. Definitely. Why do you think documentaries lend themselves so well to these stories? I think they do because, you know, it, it challenges people to get a different perspective on our history. You know, Henry Hampton did it with Eyes on the Prize. You know, I was fortunate to work on a series about the rise and fall of Jim Crow. And then when I started working with Spike, you know, <laughs> as much of a curmudgeon he can be, <laughs> he's focused on our stories too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go from working with Spike, when I think I met when on Mo Better. That's right. On Mo Better okay. Blues. Then I go to Bamboozle and in between Clockers and Jungle Fever. And Spike is looking at all aspects of the community's experience. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I think is important to remember about telling our stories is that it's not monolithic. There's many ways to tell our stories, right. there's many different perspectives. I mean, you can see it in the documentary category. You got Ezra Edelman with uh, the OJ, you got Ralph Peck with I'm Not a Negro, 
You got Roger Ross Williams with Life Animated, which is not even about a black person. You know, you got Ava doing the 13. So, we, you, so our experience and the experience of people of color in telling and making these films can be very different, you know. So that always excites me. That cha and that mm -hmm. challenges me too, you know. And when I know you tackle this in a very interesting and different way, especially on Hidden Figures, mm -hmm. because part of what you did, it was so subtle in the way you portrayed the women's homes yeah, yeah. and Thank their lives. That. Explain yeah. that a little to folks and, well, and go see the movie again because it'll yeah, really hit you when yeah. you watch it a second time. You know, it's okay. So, again, um, you're absolutely right. One of the things, again, I think people had, I would, people had the misperception of how folks lived in this time period and how we lived as a community. I mean, everyone, the, I was dealing with perception, people who had perceptions that everybody was depressed or destroyed by this experience. And, you know, I had, I had, I had, had you know, one of the things I had to say to them is, I said, no, 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 these are, these are middle class women. These, would have, these women would have been the leaders in our communities. Sure. And that would have been reflected in their environment. So that was a discussion that I had to have because that was not what was in the script. And it was very interesting, my producer, Donna Gelati, disagree, disagreed with what was in the script. So it was, it was great having her as an ally. But I was on this movie, and I wasn't going to let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> so it really was about gently guiding those folks who felt di who didn't know, because they didn't know. And so I'm so glad that you saw that, because again, that was the whole thing, is that we were, our sense of pride and our sense of community w is reflected. So the story, for example, uh, Octavia Spencer's character, Dor uh, Dor Dorothy Vaughn, you know, I, you know I, I, I always do a backstory for all the characters anyway on everything mm -hmm. that I did. But one of the th things I had to do in order to convince uh, the people, because she lives in this wonderful, fabulous mid-century house uh, with wonderful furniture and very sophisticated art, because we, that's who she, first of all, that's who that woman would have been. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I said, to the, I said to the director, so you know, she's married to an undertaker. So if you, you know, mm -hmm. if you're married to an undertaker, you're rich. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so that, you know, so I had part of my process was going around making up these stories to justify the choices to people who did not organically understand how we lived, mm -hmm. you know. You know, the other thing I want to say, you know, I'm the first African-American production designer in history. I don't know. A lot of people don't know that. Some people do know that. Um, so, you know, it's been a very, very interesting journey for me. Because usually, especially on my other movies, I'm usually the only black person in the room. You know, and part of what I do is when I get there is hire other black people to come be on the film. And that's how it happens. So, you know, that's what we do. So. Lisa, I want to ask you about hashtag Oscar so white. Because we were, in, we were talking earlier, and you had scrolled through Twitter and noticed that it hadn't really been discussed as much, obviously, this year. Tell me a little bit about what you think about that kind of online activism. Do you think it was effective? Do you think it is just a way for people to express their frustration? Um, and also a little bit about where we are this year in terms of the Academy Awards compared to where we were last year. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the, the hashtag was, was really effective. Um, because once again, like we have this conversation all the time when you sit down with your peers and you talk about your projects. Uh, but as has been mentioned, uh, it, it is a conversation that we have to constantly m push forward if we are ever going to move towards any kind of parity in terms of representation. And so, you know, it certainly was a hashtag heard around the world. A lot of organizations that I work with that are involved in the arts and in film um, have really looked at who are on their boards and who they are supporting and the stories they're moving forward and, um, are, and did take notice. Um, I think that, you know, maybe why uh, the hashtag or Oscar So White is, is a little quiet right now is because this is an, a pretty incredible year when we look at um, who has been nominated. 
um, for best picture, for best actor, for best actress, for best supporting, for uh, cinematography with Bradford Young, mm -hmm. with a sister who is a co-editor on Moonlight in the documentary category. So you know, um, there has been um, uh, recognition of this uh, great work. Um, Yes, it is done by black people, but it is great work. And then, you know, we look at Lynn manuel Moran uh, with uh, Moana, mm -hmm. you know, that song. You know, there's still a long way to go because there's no Native Americans, you know. Mm -hmm. There's uh, uh, the representation uh, for other Latinos and Latinas are limited. Um, I'd like to claim um, Judy Hopps from Zootopia, <laughs> Zootopia as, as one of ours. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, th the... Uh, it, at this moment, with this awards, uh, certainly we'll have to see uh, if it's going to be an Adele moment or a Beyonce moment mm -hmm. uh, when it comes time <laughs> to who wins. Uh, but um, what is always about important for me is the next. Mm -hmm. Is you know, what are the films in the pipeline? Yes. How are they being supported? Who, you know, what's going to happen with Black Panther and Wrinkle in Time, which have black executives involved, um, because it is always about the big picture of art and commerce. Right. And we have to remember that the all these different awards were created as marketing events. Mm -hmm. they, are, they Ultimately, it's great to receive these accolades from your peers, but more importantly, it's more important to have the box office. And I think that's like one of the, one of the many incredible right. stories about Hidden Figures, yes, is right. its performance right. there. Right. Yeah, when you look at the numbers, Hidden Figures has made $127 million, $52 million for Fences, $30 million for Lion, and $20 million for Moonlight. Right. It's been an incredible year because it does come down to commerce. And that's in the U.S. And that's in the U.S., yes. So there's a whole other story for many of these films that's about to begin internationally. And that is also, you know, goes beyond Oscar so white to representation so broad. Mm -hmm. There used to be times when you'd, I'd travel around the world and if someone only knew, you know, Amos and Andy, and that tempered their approach to me, well, wow, what a, you know, messed up time that is. But I am excited that, you know, when I was in Holland, I met not only Barry Jenkins, but his distributor who's putting his film out there. And then in the UK, I know that things are, you know, mm -hmm. all around the world, mm -hmm. our, our stories are being told and the mirror is changing. Yeah. I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then if somebody wants, we might get two or three from the audience. I promise I won't hog up all the time. Um, this is one I just, just because um, I'm feeling sassy. Um, when you heard uh, said twice, hidden fences, what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> when at the Golden Globes, two different people said hidden fences. Really? <laughs> the first one was uh, Jenna Bush, Bush yeah. and the yes, second was Michael Keaton. Yes. And I said, pray for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, black Twitter will be unleashed. <laughs> oh. I, don't, I don't have a feeling about that. I, I think it's all minor stuff. I mean, I, to me, that's a small issue. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to wait. I wouldn't. I don't. I think there are too many important issues out there, uh, in terms of. of uh, I mean, I, I, I don't. It made me angry. No, no. no well, I, I did. I, I just thought no, like yeah. I mean, you can't tell the difference between these well, two films. Yeah. I mean, it, there's a slip of a tongue, and then there's just that yeah. moment of really, come on. Yeah, yeah. These are two very yeah, different movies. Yeah. Uh, you know, I. Who's the you're being put. Uh, it's who's okay. the first person who said it? Jenna Bush. Really? Yeah. On uh, the carpet. Oh, but okay. it was her. Oh. First carpet. I yeah. guess it would But she has one job. Oh, yeah. That's my feeling. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> she had one job. You know, I, you know I, look, I'm very concerned. I think, I, you know, I think this has been a fantastic year. And uh, I just think all these movies happened to happen this year, ha which had nothing to do with Oscar So White. Because yeah. they were in the pipeline already. That's right. Yes. Yeah. My concern is what's going to happen next year and what's going to happen two years from now. And, and, and you know, um, my hope is because of the success of these movies that more movies will be produced 
not just about the African American communities, but about all the other mm -hmm. communities that Lisa was talking about. Um, I, I think, I, I think, you know, look, we have plenty of artists. What we don't have are executives. Yes. And one of the things we need to be doing, one of the things that I do now, when I, I speak at a whole bunch of places now, and I speak all the time, I talk, try and talk to people all the time, one of the things I'm trying to do is to encourage people to go into the executive part of the business because we have no executives. We don't have people I in, at the studios who are green lighting these so movies. Everybody wants to be the director, everybody wants to be the producer. We need executives, we need people there who are learning the business from the base up, who are gonna understand all the aspects of the base up of the business and get into those studios who will have the power to green light movies. Mm -hmm. So this is a big push that, I, that I, I, I think that we should be encouraging young people. You know, it's all right. To, you know, look, we don't need another director. We don't really, we don't really need any more actors. We need executives. <laughs> Can we take a couple of questions? I think we have time for a couple. Anybody? Somebody be brave. Hi. Hi. This question is for Wayne Hi. Hi. Um, you've explained a couple of times that certain conversations happen because you are in the room. That's right. Do you get tired of having these conversations, or do you feel It's obligated? exhausting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's exhausting having these conversations. It's exhausting, you know, it's exhausting going to my agent and having to say, well, you know, you can't just be sending me out for black movies. I broke that glass ceiling a long time ago. You should be, you know, diversity is not sending me out for a movie where Eddie Murphy is in. Diversity is getting me the James Bond movie. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And the fact that I Barbara still... Barbara Broccoli. Yeah, that, you, you know, the fact that I still have to have that kind of conversation, it drives me crazy. But I have to have it, and I'm, I'm being very animated today, but when I'm having it <laughs> with, with those folks, I'm much calmer, and I <laughs> speak in much gentler tones. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a constant conversation. But I think, it's, I think it's our responsibility to have that conversation so that someday, Somebody won't have to have right. a conversation. Right. Thank you. <coughs> Another question? Hi. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if in any of those conversations, part of it is about paid internships, because I feel like that is a lot of what is that foot in the door. People end up hiring their people who've been their interns when they were students. But a lot of the time, like I actually had a conversation with someone on TV. I was like, you guys don't have paid internships. Every single person coming through here is white and privileged. That's why you have 16, you know, my super sweet 16. Yes. That's what all your shows are, because you're hiring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? I don't want to hear that. I grew up in a single-parent, six-kid welfare home. When you are poor, you know how to be poor. It's easy. If you know how to be poor, it's easy to be poor. And when you're starting out in this business and you're not making any money, I already knew how to be poor. If you want to do this, then you're going to figure out how to do it. That's what you need. If you don't have that as an impulse, to figure out how to be in the business, then you don't deserve to be in the business. I'm sorry, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> so uh, you guys, you, uh, you mentioned hire, right? Like that was your big thing. I think that there's a step before that's like apply slash networking. I mean, we put a, we put a lot of time, I specifically, looking for people. Um, but, you know, the net, way this network goes is, you know, somebody's son asks to apply think that, you know, we need to encourage people to just apply. Because there are four, 400 people that, have, that apply for one job. Yeah. But you got to, you got to, then we have to encourage people to network and get out there and, and do the same things that, you know, go try to get coffee with somebody and, and look for mentors that can get you into this business. Because you're absolutely right, the heads are, are, are what they are. But, but you, somebody's got to help get people into that door. So, so I think that, the, that that step of apply or network needs to, to be uh, uh, encouraged. One of the things, you know, I, like I said, I've been going out and speaking to a lot of different groups. I actually go to a lot of adult education facilities because one of the things I believe that we should be trying to do is to plant the seed of the dream in a wide variety of communities. And part of my conversation with them is a sort of practical approach to meeting people. How do you, you know, how do you, I mean, the conversation becomes about how do you write the letter? When do you send the letter out? 
When do you follow up with that letter? When do you make the phone call? So one of the things that I, I do, in addition to trying to plant the seed of the dream, is to have a practical conversation about how to get your foot in the door in the business. If you, even if you are coming from a place of underprivileged or from a difficult beginnings, we all have to figure out what that first step is, OK? So you have the dream. Then the next step is a practical step. What do I do to get that first job? Now, you have to figure out who it is that you're going to write. But you have to write someone. You have to get in touch with someone. So part of what I do when I go out and I speak to people, I says, get a list. The, the film office exists. This is what you do. Who, this is who you call. This is, this, and I always, what I always say to people is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If, you, if you're sending out one resume and you're not following up with a phone call, then nothing will happen. The person that gets to see me is the person who contacts me 10 times. I always say nobody's sending you an engraved invitation. That's right. So like you, you, they're just you know, not. So <laughs> part of what I do, and I think part of what we're all doing here, I mean, I think mm -hmm. we're all probably actively doing this, is when I'm talking to folks, I give them, I try and plant the dream, <clears throat> but I also try and give them the very practical advice. Well, I'd just like to share that, you know, when I left the music industry, I left because I hit the glass ceiling. And I knew I was not going to work in that business again. And I kind of went on a great soul-searching journey. And uh, when I was sitting in a movie theater in the middle of India, I was like, you know what, I made these great albums, but if you didn't know the language, you could not access the message. But a picture is truly worth a thousand words. And I wanted to become a filmmaker. And I spoke to friends that I had gone to school with and this and that, and they said, well, you have to move to LA, and you're going to have to get coffee for somebody for like many years, and maybe you'll m make your way. And I just said, no, I want to be in New York. I'm an independent thinker and creator. This is where my community is. And so I took another kind of gig. I volunteered at film festivals. I went to film, back to film school, which I had studied as an undergrad also. I studied film theory. I just immersed myself in the community and was willing to help out. A friend was doing a, a short, and he needed a script supervisor. I said, OK, I'll do it. I called someone. I said, what is a script supervisor? <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, what book? What book? And, and they said, you know what? Have a coffee with me. It's, what, a seven-minute short. We'll help you work through this and not let your friend down, because that's an important mm -hmm. part of it, is to always present yourself and your skills uh, correctly. Uh, but I agree with you that it is about getting out there and jumping in the water. Um, but I do have to say that if in the big picture there are paid internships, which uh, these companies can afford to do, it certainly can help people. Um, it's, it's not easy to go to LA for the summer. Um, and as I've gotten older, yeah, I can go wherever because I have friends everywhere. But that is not also the situation that some of our young people are in. This hour went really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to um, just check in with everybody about what your next big project is, what you're excited about, what you're passionate about, what's in your, your personal, professional pipeline. Lisa. Um, the theatrical release of uh, Double Play, the film I just produced that Ernest Dickerson uh, directed. Uh, will be in your theaters this year. Did it play in Europe already? Uh, it, we just premiered at the Rotterdam Film Festival. Right. Good. Thank you. <laughs> and um, Gabourey Sidibe's directorial debut, That's The exciting. Tale of Four, uh, will also be seen this year. Excellent. When? For I'm you. out of work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I think, you're going to be yeah, polishing your awards. I mean, it's this is okay. what you're going to be doing after yeah, like I mean, But that's okay. I mean, that's just an aspect of the business. You know, it happens. Uh, something will happen, and I don't know what's next. So I'm reading a lot of great books right now. So. <laughs> and Sam, what's what's next for you? The talk. The talk. Yes. <laughs> as, as you all know, it's on February 20th. Tell all your friends and family. And then I also just finished up uh, for American Masters. They'll be on in 2018. 
uh, Sammy Davis Jr. documentary called I Gotta Be Me. Everybody, please give our panel a round of applause. <laughs>